Hello and welcome to this joint production of News Click and The Citizen. 43 years ago, on this day, emergency was imposed. But what we are witnessing today is undeclared emergency. Mobs have taken over the streets. The government has been continuously using the ordinance route to bring different bills. And the governors are being used to form the government. To discuss these issues, we are joined by Prabir Purkasta, who is editor-in-chief of News Click, and was also Indira Gandhi's guest for one year during emergency and Sima Mustafa, editor-in-chief of The Citizen. Welcome to News Click, both of you. So let's start with what was happening in 1975, because you were arrested and you were there in jail for almost one year, Prabir. So what basically led to the emergency and what were the basic changes that you witnessed during those one years in jail? Well, one year in jail and the three months before, because I was, I was arrested three months after the emergency was declared, because all the raids and other things had gone on in that period. I think it's important to recognize that the cause for declaring the emergency has not been clear to most people. If you think of that times, we've had similar times before or after. So it seemed that Mrs. Gandhi being unseated in the uh, Raibarilli case was perhaps the igniting, you know, the last straw as it were. And she was in a certain state of perhaps paranoia, uncertainty. It's very difficult to make out because politically, I don't think the Indian state was in such a crisis to require this. The, don't forget the 71 war had given her a huge mandate in the elections. And whatever dissent was there on the ground, which was building up, it, was, it didn't seem to warrant the kind of crisis she introduced through the emergency. So that's one part of it, but it's also very clear that it taught the Indian people the value of having the right to vote and the right of free speech, however limited it might be. The fact that the big, big press con controls the media, that the government controls various other things, but the simple fact that you had the right to vote, you could overturn a particular government, you could do various things, you could say various things, you could build protests, you could have demonstrations, those things became much more valuable. I did not for a long time after an emergency hear that you know the value of dictatorship, which is something we used to keep on hearing before that India needs a benevolent dictator, which was the argument which in a lot of the third world countries had gained ground at that. So I think that is the value that Mrs. Gandhi taught us, though completely in, you know, un unwittingly, so to say, that the value of the, the simple democratic liberties, I will not call that full-fledged democracy in that sense, but the simple value of the vote, the right to free speech, the right to protest, how much they meant to us is something that we did not understand till we found they were taken away and the lowly police constable or a lowly police clerk had more power than, say, a sarpanch or a village pradhan or anybody in society who was outside the government, however much his political popularity or spread might be. I think that's an important issue that I think the emergency taught us. Right. So, I mean, you mentioned yes. an important point there when you're talking about the free speech. So it also becomes important to understand what role did media play during the emergency because as LK Adwani pointed out that when media was asked to bend it started crawling. So I mean what was media's role during the entire emergency period? Well I think it was that it was the time before television, right? So you had print media basically and before the internet. And uh, most of the big newspapers were craven. And Advani was right that they crawled. And uh, I think the Indian Express protested a little bit. I know the Patriot, which was run by the Tarnarayanan, protested and paid a price. And the, back, the financial backbone of that paper was almost finished. The Statesman, there was some protest, but Times of India, Hindustan Times, name them. They were all there wagging their tails and doing what the government wanted it to, them to do. But here I want to make a point is that while people who were there during the emergency completely succumbed, I was, I was amongst that generation of journalists who came post-emergency. And I came into what was suddenly a golden age of journalism. Because suddenly the media had got very 
very, very aware, as you said about becoming aware of your rights, we'd become completely aware of our rights, of the importance of independence, of freedom. And the 80s was a period, was really the golden age of journalism. It was just before television. There was corporate control, but the corporates were not able to control. The professional editors had come back into the business and were completely calling the shots. And the younger reporters like us who joined were passion, you know, impassioned by what was happening. There were protests all the time. We were walking down Rajpath. I've never seen journalists march in protest in the way they did during the 80s. The Bihar bill, uh, Gundu, uh, the Karnataka bill, Gundu Rao tried to muzzle the press. It was dropped because of protests in Delhi. Similarly, in Bihar, Jagannath Mishra was bringing a bill again to do something to the media after Indira Gandhi came back to power. Again, that was cuttle. So it was a very good period. And then it did last. Yeah, so that's where I was coming to basically because if you look at the current context, the current situation, corporates have taken over the media completely now. And if you look at the media channels, especially the television, they're towing the line of the government basically and they're creating a mob, mob which goes on the roads and lynches people and and they're speaking as mouthpiece of the government. So would it, would it be wrong to say or would it be right to say that what we are witnessing today is some sort of undeclared emergency? I think so. I think uh, where the media is concerned, a very, while we learned for a period of how to defend ourselves, the governments and all the political parties that were in power, which was or, or were also in the opposition, which includes the BJP, realize that the way to control the media was not through direct censorship, but through indirect censorship, which is more powerful and more effective without bringing the government into direct conflict with us. So the corporates come in, always there because their business interests have to be controlled and protected by governments. And now when television came, it needed big money. And the more money you need, the more the corporate role. And that's how the control has been completely and totally established. Now the government just has to pick up a phone call and uh, p uh, pick up a phone and make a call to the television channel. And this was under the last government also, by the way. It was under the Congress. Uh, there was uh, Mr. Chidambaram then, and then there was Mr. Jaitley now, and there's everybody else now. You just have to call the newspaper or the television channel and close the story. Yeah, I mean, one example of that is... No, let me pick up the issue that you're raising. The, for the issue of undeclared emergency. I think that we have to say yes and no. Yes, because there are certain parts of it which are not only, I will say, what it was during emergency or possibly even worse. Because you have now essentially what you were talking about mob rule. Or I will not even talk as mob rule, but the organized goons taking law in their own hands or not even law, their hate and prejudice, quote unquote, in their own hands, and quite act knowledgeable about the fact, clear about the fact that state is not going to intervene, is going to protect them. If you take all these attacks, the lynchings we are talking about, most of the time the cases have been launched against the victims. You have a whole list of them that News Click has also covered, Citizen has also covered. So these are far beyond what we have seen earlier. This is not what we saw during emergency because there was no, in that sense, though there were youth congress hoods which were mobilized at different points. The scale was the nothing on this, on this line, on this, on this, at this lane, at this level. So you have this mob violence combining with loss of democratic rights. That is the main threat that you see. At the moment, yes, we have, because it's a federal government still there is a federal structure there are states they have certain powers so it's not that easy in india today to have a completely unitary uh, shall we say undemocratic government it's not that easy it can be done but not that easy but the threat that we see is the combination of state power with mob violence if you will mob rule if you will that proposes the threat 
and the fact that you are increasingly politicizing different organs of the state, including now the army. I think those are the long-term threats that we see. So the democratic structure is being essentially weakened from inside. So it's not one blow, but multiple or shall we say thousand cuts that we are now Also, when it comes to constitution, because this government has seen many firsts. For example, a uh, budget is presented and there is no, disc no discussion takes place on it. Four senior most judges of the Supreme Court come out and say there is something wrong with the judiciary and nobody intervenes. Ordinance route is, complete, uh, is always taken and then you have governors asking the party with no majority or even not having single largest majority to come and form the government. So, constitution basically is under threat, right? No, I, I just want to say that, there, like you said, there's some things that have happened before and some things that are really a first for even us. Uh, and the misuse of governors, it's been fairly established. And obviously, if it goes on unchecked and different governments come and start taking control, then it's going to get worse, as we have seen it happening. But, you know, constitutionally elected uh, governments of Andhra Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka were overthrown earlier and they are being overthrown today. Governors are being used in a completely more blatant and brazen manner perhaps than they were earlier. But these are sort of things with the precedence. But what the real problem is mob rule, it is the creation of a parallel state which is protected by the state. So the non-state being protected by the state machinery. And then you, that non-state emerging as armies and actually trying to strike fear by targeting specific castes, specific communities, specific individuals, all in the name of a certain ideology. That's where the real problem is. I mean, also there's this entire propaganda of, I mean, this hyper-nationalism which has been growing since last past few months, especially in past one month we have seen they're talking about Kashmir extensively taking that issue outside in other parts of the country and pitching that nationalism issue which is creating a binary between Jammu and Kashmir and rest of India and also creating sort of a communal divide when it comes binary to Binary between Jammu, Jammu and, and Kashmir, Kashmir as well. Yeah. But no, when you talk of hyper-nationalism, let's be very clear. Hyper-nationalism with Hindu, Hindutva ideology, which Savarkar said is nothing to do with Hinduism. Let's be very clear on it. It's Hindu identity. Now that has always been the position of the RSS. So right from the 50s onwards, they have been trying to say our nationalism should be based on Hindu identity and they have always been hyper-nationalist. That's also the reason Atal Bihari Vajpayee called Mrs. Uh, Gandhi Durga, right. okay, after the 71 war, which he later on tried to retract. But the point is that that hyper-nationalism and Hindu identity have been the two planks of the uh, BJP RSS combined. So that's one common part that is there. It's, it must be understood that this is also the attack on the constitution right. because the all the constitutional absolutely. values are essentially threatened. If you try to introduce as you're doing it from the classroom to every institution in the country, you are introducing this. So that is where the constitutional attack is the sharpest. Mm -hmm. It's not only through the, what you are talking about in terms of abrogating X, Y, or Z, or the uh, putting ordinances. As Seema said, all those things have happened in the past. Yes, more so today than before, sure. But the door on this was cracked open by the Congress really long back. What is new? is the complete communalization of the state and its machinery along with the uh, rule of the private right. armies as she was saying and essentially mob violence being unleashed now using social media and also the troll tv channels like republic tv and times uh, now. And, it, and apart from just that uh, you know uh, republic and times now whatever right. that kind of television actually shows up uh, as terrible and it makes us then accept the already bad is good. The, the problem is, and that is again we lose sight and the viewers lose sight of the um, real picture, is that all television is bought. Some is more trollish and more propagandist and completely sold out, but the rest have also been sold out. 
There is nothing of the poor on any television channel. There is nothing of uh, the farmers on any television channel. There's nothing that doesn't draw that kind of, you know, viewership right. that's there. So, so basically one point you were saying when you were talking about RSS and the constitution, it's the same organization which said that the founder said that Manu Smithy should be the constitution, not what Ambedkar. Basis of the constitution. Basis of the constitution, not what Ambedkar has written, right? So, I mean, you pointed out one important thing, which is social media. Um, recently now their own ministers and members are facing the same heat. Sushma Swaraj is being trolled continuously since last three days because she she sacked a passport officer in Lucknow who, provide, who refused to give passport to an interfaith couple. So, and let's go back a bit. 2014 when Modi was campaigning, the, he was talking about how Congress has ruined the country and emergency was one among the focus that how Indira Gandhi implemented it. When we keep 2019 in mind, would he not be questioned on the same lines? Well, let's like, again take a little tack on this. I think that we should be very clear that what they are creating is what I would call the new normal. The new normal is hatred is normal. Discrimination against minorities is normal. As assumption that caste indicates a certain innate ability is normal. This is the new normal that is being sought to be introduced or sought to be uh, made the normal. The normal. Yes. <laughs> the normal. This new normal is what we are seeing emerge. And I think that's the threat to all of us, that this creeping abnormalities, if you will, the creep, creeping distortions which slowly, you know, leach away the basis of your democracy or your civil liberties, this then tends to be overlooked because it's happening bit by bit every day. Now, I think the Indian people are not that stupid. I think in most occasions they assert good common sense. How much and how long can you fool them is the question. And I think 2019 for all of us is going to be a big question on. So on the concluding note, I mean, keeping 2019 in mind once again, when emergency was there, there was massive resistance. Do you see something like that happening? Well, let's be very honest. During emergency, the resistance had petered out. And it, 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 it is only when the emergency started being relaxed, people then you could see it coming out in large numbers, the mood of the country changing. This was actually a, something which we have not seen so sharply take place ever. People were quiet during emergency. They were sullen, shall we say. They were angry, but there was the resistance, the, official, the actual physical resistance was very relatively had weak. Which is why you had this cobbled up opposition government, government that government. finally came, you know, the first coalition, yeah. which didn't and, last. And it actually, the, they, they initially were even hesitant to contest the elections. Oh. They didn't know that whether, you know, the election would be completely rigged. Mrs. And Gandhi. they got Indira Gandhi back. Mrs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> later. But Within a year and a half. What, what I'm saying is ki that, that whole period of two, two and a half months, the, with, that is something which is very remarkable. And that's the other point that I would like to make is that actually Mrs. Gandhi did not remove or uh, weaken emergency and allow the elections because of the strong resistance. It was her belief that she would win and therefore she could put the stamp of approval of the people of India. Uh, that that really led to her wanting or, or declaring election. So we must be clear about that. I do feel that today the ground cell of, of opinion that I see is something that I would think can be of a similar order that we saw in those three months when the elections were declared and final elections took place. And I think there's a big difference also, one you know, which uh, suddenly uh, struck me, is that when Indira Gandhi bought, brought an emergency, she brought it out of her own personal like paranoia, insecurity, the influence of Sanjay Gandhi, but not because of ideology. And that is why she went back on the election mode, trying to, you know, uh, thinking that she had overcome her paranoia and her insecurities and get today and, and get legitimacy. And today it is ideological. And that is the main big difference. One is really long term. One had come in for a short term measure. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks a lot, Seema. Thanks a lot, Prabhu. Thank you for watching this program.